Welcome to Jerusalem. Over the last 25 years, these are words which I have had the privilege to speak to many groups of pilgrims who have come to the Holy Land to deepen their faith by walking in the footsteps of Jesus. Starting in the Galilee and tracing their way across Palestine and Israel, such pilgrims come eventually to Jerusalem, as did Jesus some 2,000 years before them. The Jerusalem that Jesus experienced was a place of conflicts and tensions, some of which were reflected in something as simple as the sign placed on his cross, which was written in Greek, Hebrew and Latin. The signposts that pilgrims will see as they walk the way of the cross today are again in three languages, Hebrew, Latin and Arabic, reflecting the conflicts and tensions of our own era. As we look again at the overlapping claims and complexities that Jerusalem has known for so long, could there be any other place where God could come to suffer and to die? Listen, I am casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow, and on the third day I finish my work. Yet today, tomorrow, and the next day I must be on my way, because it is impossible for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you. And I tell you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And so we come as all Christians must come to the Via Dolorosa. Not in Jerusalem, but in our own hearts and minds and souls. Whatever freedoms or restrictions affect us, that spiritual journey is the call of every Christian. And today, I invite you to join me as I journey again along the Via Dolorosa of Jerusalem. If the world was not devastated by the coronavirus, the streets of Jerusalem would be full to overflowing with pilgrims at this holy time of the year. As it is, like our own streets, the old city of Jerusalem is eerily empty, as even the resident Christians of the Holy Land shelter in place at home. But now we will join them in spirit as we walk the way of the cross online making our way through the Muslim quarter of the Old City into the Christian quarter, as we mark each of the traditional 14 stations of the cross, where, over many centuries, Christians have observed them in person. The way in which we will observe the stations today is by a simple pair of Bible readings at each one. Some readings will relate the Passion story explicitly, and some will offer prophecy or commentary to help us enter into the mystery of Christ's suffering and death. Not all of the events commemorated in the stations appear in the Gospel accounts, but each of them seeks to offer an insight into Jesus' experiences in the last hours of his life. Had we the privilege of walking this walk in person, we would have begun by celebrating the Eucharist together in a 19th century basilica built over a stretch of 1st century stone pavement believed to be close to where Pilate held court while in Jerusalem. At this Eucharist, after receiving communion, we would have blessed olive wood crosses and offered you one to carry in your hand as you walked with Jesus. The route of the Via Dolorosa is a complicated and winding one that does not necessarily make you think of how Jerusalem would have looked 2,000 years ago. Sometimes the tensions that flare up between the city's residents is obvious and palpable, as it was when Jesus walked these streets. To avoid getting lost and to understand what we are experiencing, local wisdom is essential. But despite the tensions and complexities, 
the presence of crowds of pilgrims and the everyday life of the local residents, the vast majority of whom are not Christians, the goal of the pilgrim is simple. For we come, in person or online, so that we may understand more fully and clearly what God in Christ did for us, so that we may enter more fully into Christ's suffering and death, so that we may walk with Jesus once again through the last hours of his life and to the tomb in which he was buried. Almighty God, whose most dear Son went not up to joy, but first he suffered pain, and entered not into glory before he was crucified, mercifully grant that we, walking the way of the cross, may find it none other than the way of life and peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. First station, Jesus is condemned to death. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know I find no case against him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die because he has claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and the power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, But the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, Here is your king. They cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but the emperor. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. The second station, Jesus receives his cross. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases. Yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. 
Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. After the first two stations, the Via Dolorosa winds its way past the Austrian hospice, once the only working hospital inside the old city walls, and on to one of the main shopping streets of the Muslim quarter of the old city. The streets are often crowded, but sometimes empty. Pilgrims come past at almost all hours of the day. The third station. Jesus falls the first time. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the inequity of all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that was led to the slaughter, like a sheep that is before its shearers is silent. So he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice, he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. O Lord, God of my salvation, when at night I cry out in your presence, let my prayer come before you. Incline your ear to my cry. For my soul is full of troubles and my life draws near to Sheol. I am counted among those who go down to the pit. I am like those who have no help. The fourth station, Jesus meets his mother. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem to search for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Child, why have you treated us like this? Look, your father and I have been searching for you in great anxiety. He said to them, Why were you searching for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? Upon my bed at night I sought him whom my soul loves. I sought him, but found him not. I called him, but he gave no answer. I will rise now and go about the city in the streets and in the squares. I will seek him whom my soul loves. I sought him, but found him not. The sentinels found me as they went about in the city. Have you seen him whom my soul loves? Scarcely have I passed them when I found him whom my soul loves. I held him and would not let him go until I brought him into my mother's house and into the chamber of her that conceived me. The fifth station is marked by a small chapel owned by the Franciscans, and it commemorates Simon being made to help Jesus by carrying his cross. When I first visited Jerusalem in 1996, the chapel was covered in graffiti, thankfully now removed. On this first visit, at this very spot that speaks of the need to serve and to support others, it was poignant to see a blind pilgrim being helped by a companion to walk the way of the cross. As we pray these stations, let us hold in our prayers all who have been called to carry the cross in this time of sickness and fear. The fifth station, Simon of Cyrene takes the cross. They compelled a passerby who was coming in from the country to carry his cross. It was Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I've made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. Leaving the fifth station, the Via Dolorosa starts to climb a hill. It is not a hill that is green 
and there is nothing of beauty about it. The hill takes us on through the streets of the souk, the old city, and we come, after a couple of minutes' walk, to the sixth station, that which commemorates the story of Veronica wiping the face of Jesus. You will search in vain to find the name Veronica in any of the four Gospels. Nevertheless, there is a profound truth to the story because it stands as an icon of the compassion which all who follow Christ are called to show to those whose suffering they encounter. At the sixth station, we find the workshop and chapel of the Little Sisters of Jesus, a community of nuns who make and sell icons at a modest price to support their ministry. We should pray at this station that our lives are a true icon, a Vera icon, of the love that Christ shows to the world. The sixth station, Veronica wipes the face of Jesus. For he grew up before him like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. And as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him of no account. Just as there were many who were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of mortals. So he shall startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which had not been told them they shall see, and that which they had not heard they shall contemplate. Another couple of minutes walk uphill will bring us to a major road junction in the souk. We feel the cobbles under our feet. We stumble as we walk on the uneven ground, jostled by those around us. It's a fitting reminder that if we stumble, we can certainly believe that when Jesus walked this way, he too will have stumbled. The seventh station. Jesus falls the second time. Although he was in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered, and, having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him, having been designated by God a high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek. Just around the corner from the seventh station is the eighth station, the first of the stations in the Christian quarter of the old city. There is very little to see, save a stone marker on the wall of an Orthodox monastery. In Greek, it proclaims Jesus Christ conquers and gives hope to the pilgrims who pass by, remembering the story of the women of Jerusalem weeping for Jesus. The eighth station, the women of Jerusalem weep for Jesus. A great number of people followed him, and among them were women who were beating their breasts and wailing for him. But Jesus turned to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For the days are surely coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren, and the wombs that never bore, and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if they do this when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? But truly God has listened. He has given heed to the words of my prayer. Blessed be God, because he has not rejected my prayer or removed his steadfast love from me. Leaving the eighth station and heading on towards the ninth, 
pilgrims experience one of the busiest shopping streets in the entire souk, a street busy by day, but should you walk it at night time, like all of the old city, almost deserted. From here there is a sudden and unexpected right-hand turn that leads pilgrims onto the roof of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. As they ascend, suddenly they see a cross shining out, the gold cross on top of the principal dome of this church. It is a fitting reminder of why we are walking the route and what we can expect to experience. The Ninth Station Jesus falls the third time. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. You've made my days a few hand breaths and my lifetime is as nothing in your sight. Surely everyone stands as a mere breath. Surely everyone goes about like a shadow. Surely for nothing they are in turmoil. They heap up and do not know who will gather. And now, O oh Lord, what do I wait for? My hope is in you. Deliver me from all my transgressions. Do not make me the scorn of the fool. I am silent. I do not open my mouth, for it is you who have done it. Remove your stroke from me. I am worn down by the blows of your hand. You chastise mortals in punishment for sin, consuming like a moth that which is dear to them. Surely everyone is a mere breath. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and give ear to my cry. Do not hold your peace at my tears, for I am your passing guest, an alien like all my forebears. Turn your gaze away from me, that I may smile again before I depart and am no more. From the ninth station, outside the Coptic Patriarchate, pilgrims enter the courtyard of the Ethiopian community, who live in poverty on the roof of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, having been evicted from the main body of the church in the 16th century because they could not afford their share of the rent. A small doorway, on which countless taller pilgrims have banged their foreheads over the years, leads downstairs through a pair of small chapels in which the Ethiopians worship. Some groups observe the tenth station here, remembering how Jesus was stripped of clothing and dignity alongside this small faith community from whom much was stripped over the years. The tenth station, Jesus is stripped of his garments. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. Coming down through the Ethiopian chapels, pilgrims arrive at last in the parvis, the courtyard of the Holy Sepulchre. While the church is open, the stream of pilgrims is normally unending, and it must be one of the only churches in the world to have its own police station adjacent. Whether or not they have walked the entire Via Dolorosa, Christians from every country and every denomination pass through this courtyard into the church, minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day, to visit what almost everyone believes to be the place of Christ's crucifixion and death, and the place of his burial, and thus his resurrection. As you enter this unique church, a set of stairs on the right take you up to a balcony where there are two adjacent chapels. The first belongs to the Franciscans and marks the 11th station, remembering Jesus being nailed to the cross. The second belongs to the Greek Orthodox and marks the place of Calvary itself, the 12th station where Jesus dies on the cross. The eleventh station, Jesus is nailed to the cross. 
When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing, and the people stood by watching. But the leader scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Messiah of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were there hanging with him kept deriving him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have been condemned justly, for are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He replied, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. My spirit is broken, my days are extinct, the grave is ready for me. Surely there are mockers around me, and my eye dwells on their provocation. He has made me a byword of the peoples, and I am one before whom people spit. My eye has grown dim from grief, and all my members are like a shadow. The Twelfth Station Jesus dies on the cross. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloe, Eloe, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, Listen, he is calling for Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. Then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now when the centurion, who stood facing him, saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, Truly, this man was God's son. But we have this treasure in clay jars, so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. We are afflicted in every way but not crushed, perplexed but not driven to despair, persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be made visible in our bodies. For while we live, we are always being given up to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may be made visible in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. When you enter the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, 
the first thing that catches your eye is a large stone slab, revered as being the stone of anointing, where Jesus' body was prepared for burial when he was taken down from the cross. This marks the 13th station, and despite the fact that the present stone dates from the 19th century, is a place of particular reverence for pilgrims and the clergy of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. The 13th station, Jesus is taken down from the cross. Many women were also there, looking on from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee and provided for him. Among them were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who was also a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. At the western end of the church, under the larger of its two domes, sits a building within a building. Known as the Edicule, it is built over what is believed to be the tomb in which Jesus was laid to rest on the evening of Good Friday. The most holy place in the most holy church building in the world, it is the focal point of liturgy and pilgrimage for all the Christians who visit or reside in Jerusalem. Guarded by Greek monks, pilgrims can wait for hours to enter one by one to pray for a few moments at the place where Christ was buried before being ushered onwards so that others might take their spot. Holes in the side of the edicule allow a glimpse into the outer chapel of two small places of worship inside the building. And at many points of the day, the liturgies and processions of the various churches which share access to this most holy place can be witnessed. And it is here that the Via Dolorosa comes to an end, as pilgrims mark the 14th and the final station of the cross. The 14th station, Jesus is laid in the tomb. Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who is also himself waiting expectantly for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. When Pilate wondered if he was already dead, and summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he had been dead for some time. When he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the body to Joseph. Then Joseph bought a linen cloth, and taking down the body, wrapped it in the linen cloth, and laid it in a tomb that had been hewn out of the rock. He then rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where the body was laid. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. And so darkness falls. Darkness falls in a tomb sealed by a stone. Darkness falls on a world stricken by a vicious pandemic. Darkness falls in the church of the Holy Sepulchre. But even in that darkness, 
Christians gather to watch, to pray and to keep vigil, confident that in that death on a cross they have seen the love of God made perfect and complete, and in that love they know there will be a light which no darkness will ever extinguish. And with them we keep watch and we pray this Good Friday and throughout our lives. Amen.